Mr. Hartz back at you again for day 46. Today in day 46, we are going to be looking at the extreme value theorem. It's not a theorem that you necessarily have to invoke on a test as an explanation like you do on mean value theorem and intermediate value theorem, but it's a theorem that helps us identify absolute maxes and absolute mins. Before we get into the extreme value theorem, I want to look at this problem. I told you we'd look at this in the video today. So take a look at this particular problem here. Here we have a table of values. And it says explain why there must be a C where C is between negative 2 and 4, such that F prime of C equals negative 3. First off, when you look at this problem, what are you thinking? Which theorem are you thinking about? All right, there's two we know. This is the mean value theorem. Our table is about F and our question is about F prime of C. So I want to use the mean value theorem to show that an F prime of C value must equal negative 3 somewhere in there. Well, first off, I actually can't explain that with this given setup because what do I need to know about F? Well, F must be differentiable. So I'm going to add that in here. F is a differentiable function. Without that piece of information, there's no way to explain that correctly. I need to know F is differentiable. So I wanted to put this in here to show you what a good explanation looks like for the things that I'm going to be looking for when you take this test a week from today. So here's what we have. Um, I'm thinking mean value theorem because the mean value theorem says that there must be an F prime of C equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Right, so I want to use that formula to help me here. And so I'm looking at the slope of the secant line in between my A and B. The first thing I like to do here is I like to label two, negative 2 as A and 4 as B. And I use those letters a lot. So sometimes I just put them right underneath there to remind me which one is A and which one is B. Okay, so in order to start this, I have to first make sure that I can use the mean value theorem. So I'm going to state that F is differentiable. So the first thing I'm going to say in my response here is since F is a differentiable function, there must be a C where negative 2 is less than C is less than 4 such that F prime of C equals, okay, this is where I need to do F of B minus F of A, but instead of using A and B, I'm going to use the, the numbers that correspond with B and A. So I'm going to say F of 4 minus f of negative 2 over 4 minus negative 2. Okay. You don't necessarily have to put that, but you do need a difference quotient. Okay, So don't just go straight to negative 3 here. We need to actually show that these values, that this value does equal negative 3. That was a problem on the 2018 AP exam that a lot of people missed. So now we can figure out what those numbers are, right? F of 4, we can tell from our table, is negative 14. Minus F of negative 2. F of negative 2 is 4. Over 4 plus 2 is 6. So you can have either or here, or both. Okay. But what they do, are they are going to need to see it a difference quotient set equal to f prime of c. Now we can simplify this down. Negative 14 minus 4 is negative 18. So I get that this equals negative 18 over 6, which does in fact equal negative 3. 
So I can say that f prime of c must equal negative 3 because of the MVT. So here's what I'm looking for. I'm going to give you a check mark on your difference quotient, either one of these or both. I'm going to give you a check mark for stating that f is differentiable. You need to state that, and you need to state MVT. Those are the three things that I'm going to be looking for on your homework and on your test to earn full credit. Okay. Next, let's talk about the extreme value theorem. The extreme value theorem is really important when we want to find what are called an absolute max and an absolute min. Okay, so I want to talk about these. And I want to talk about the difference between an absolute maximum value and the x value where the absolute max occurs. Okay. Well, let's go back to a local max or a relative max, right? A local max is the highest point in its little area. An absolute max is the highest point on the entire graph or on the entire interval that we're looking at. So an absolute maximum is the highest point on the graph. Okay. An absolute minimum then would be the lowest point on the interval of the graph. Sometimes we look at the interval from negative infinity to infinity, right? Then it's just the highest overall point on the graph anywhere. But oftentimes this is restricted between, you know, 0 and 10, right? So I want to look at a restricted one. I just want to show you a, a quick graph here. So on this graph, right, if I was looking for the absolute max and the absolute min, I want to consider which point is the highest on this entire graph. Well, that will be our absolute max. So the, the absolute highest I go is right here. This would be your absolute max. Right, and that's a point. I'll call this point C1. Right, that absolute maximum is at the point C1, comma, if this is a graph of f of x, f of C1. On this particular graph, our absolute minimum occurs right here. That is the lowest point on our interval. So I'm going to call that C2. So this is my absolute min. And that occurs at the point C2, comma, F of C2. Now, not all, not all intervals will have an absolute max. If I had a vertical asymptote in there, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So we, we wouldn't say that it has an absolute max, right? Because it keeps getting infinitely big. We don't say infinity. We just say it doesn't have an absolute max. Whatever number I pick, I can pick a number higher, okay? 
So what types of points does that absolute max and absolute min occur at? Well, these ones happen to occur at critical points, right, on our graph of f of x. But that's not the only place where they can occur. Let me show you another graph. So on this particular graph, our absolute maximum happens to be right here. Okay, our absolute max occurs at the point A comma F of A. Whereas our absolute min, we'll call this C1, our absolute min, our absolute min occurs at the point C1 comma F of C1. So I want you to think about what different types of points could be our absolute max and our absolute min. Well, as we can see, they can only occur at one of two places, and that's what the that's what the extreme value theorem says, as long as we know our function is continuous. So let me state this out for you. EVT for extreme value theorem. If F is continuous, On a closed interval AB, the interval has to be closed because we have to actually have those endpoints. So as long as F is continuous, as long as we don't have any jumps or asymptotes or, or anything like that, we don't need differentiability here. We simply need continuity. So in that way, it's kind of like the IVT. If F is continuous on AB, then F has at least one absolute max and at least one absolute min. Occasionally we look at some things where they might have two absolute maxes. Right, there are two places that are equally high, right? So we call both of them an absolute max, or they might have two absolute mins. Usually we, the problems tend to only have one absolute max and one absolute min, mostly on the AP tests that I've seen. Um, but just be prepared, it's okay that if you get two. Okay, but what's really important here, so as long as F is continuous on a closed interval AB, you are going to get an absolute max, you are gonna get an absolute min, What's really important here is where those could occur. These can only occur at endpoints and critical points. So there are infinitely numbers between A and B on that closed interval. I don't have to check all infinite of those. I only need to check the endpoints and the critical points. Those are the only places that I need to check. Then I want to make a table to see which ones actually make the biggest numbers, which, ones, which one makes the biggest number, which one makes the smallest number. Okay? So that's what the EVT is. As long as F is continuous on A, B, then F has at least one absolute max, one absolute min, and these can only occur at endpoints and critical points. Those are the only places we need to check. Okay, now the other thing is wording here can be tricky. Okay. When they say, 
what is the x value where absolute max occurs? If they say that, if they want to know the x value where the absolute max occurs, think about that point. Right, let's say it's c comma f of c. You are reporting c. You are reporting the x value. Okay, that will be reported. Whatever that number is, whether it's ten or whatever, four. That's the number you report. But if they say, and this sounds very similar. If they say, what is the absolute maximum value of F? If they phrase it that way, and we get C comma F of C as our answer, you are reporting the F of C, the Y value. You got to be very, very, very careful on this. If they want the x value, report the x value. If it specifically says x value. When they say, what is the absolute maximum value of f? You need to find those x values, but you need to plug them in and you need to report the y value or the f of c value. Okay. We'll practice this on Wednesday and Thursday for sure. And we'll practice it a ton right before the AP exam. So you don't lose a point because you report the wrong one. Okay. Very, very, very important. Okay, let's take a look. I have a sample problem on the next slide here. We're just going to do one sample problem. So pause the video quick and write this problem down. Okay, so here we have it. It says f of x equals x cubed minus 3x plus 4. It says find the absolute maximum value and absolute minimum value of f on the interval negative 3 to 3 halves. So first off, if I was taking the AP test and I saw this question, right away I would think to myself, I am reporting the y values, right? I eventually have to report the y values. That's really important. The next thing I think about is, okay, absolute max, or absolute max and absolute min, those can only occur at one of two different types of places. They could occur at an end point or they could occur at a critical point. That's it. Those are my only options. So I for sure need to check my endpoints of negative three and three halves. I need to plug those into F to find their values because those could be our absolute max or absolute min. But I also need to check all my critical points. I'm going to need to check all of these things. And right now, I don't even know how many critical points I have. So the, this is kind of an arduous task. It's been heavily assessed on the last two, three years, AP exams. They've always had absolute max, absolute min problems on the free response for lots of points. So we want to make sure we're really good at this. The first thing I want to do here is identify the critical points of F. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the critical points. From our note cards that we made today, we know that critical points occur when F prime equals zero or F prime is undefined. So I need to find F prime of X and set it equal to zero. Well, that's a pretty easy task here. F prime of X is three X squared minus three. And I want to set that thing equal to zero. Okay, now doing this, we got to be careful. I'm going to add the three over and divide by three. And I got x squared equals one. Here's where you need to be very careful. One is not your only answer here. We get x equals plus or minus one. So there are two critical points of f. The next thing I want to do is check to see, are my critical points on the interval that I'm looking at? Well, the interval goes from negative 3 to 3 halves. So both positive and negative 1 are on that interval. 
If one or both of them weren't, I'd throw them out and not use them. However, usually the critical points you get are in those intervals. So if you throw them both out, I would double check your work to make sure you actually should throw them out. Okay, so we get plus and minus one. So what I like to do now is do what's called a candidates test. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make a box right here. And on the left side, I'm gonna have X. On the right side, I'm gonna have F of X. Because I need to report the Y value, and I need to determine what that Y value is, even if I had to report the X value, I still need to know both the X and the Y value to figure out which one of these is actually the biggest and which one is the smallest. Now I like to write these numbers from left to right. I guess you don't have to, but it's kind of a good habit to do that. So I think of my numbers, right, the numbers I need to test are plus or minus one. I need to check negative three and I need to check three halves, right? These two are endpoints. These two are critical points. So my smallest number here is negative three. My next smallest is negative one. My next is positive one. And my next is positive three halves. Those are the four points that I have to test. And I have to check all four because I don't know where my absolute min and max are, are going to occur until I do all of them. Notice that the right side of my column is f of x. That's a huge clue on where we plug in these numbers, right? We're not plugging in the, them into f prime. We're plugging them into f. So the first thing I want to do is figure out, I have to figure these all out. I have to figure out f of negative 3. So f of negative 3, I'm going to go back to my function. I've got x cubed. So I got negative 3 cubed minus 3 times negative 3 plus 4. Okay? And this is probably going to be no calculator, so don't reach for those calculators. Do it by hand. Negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3 is negative 27. Right? When we cube a negative number, it stays negative. Then it's going to be plus 9 plus 4. Negative 27 plus 9 is negative 18. Negative 18 plus 4 is negative 14. So I report that right here. Okay. The reason I like putting this problem type of problem on here is you have to do so much work to test it. Okay. Next, I'm going to check f of negative 1. Well, that's going to be negative 1 cubed minus 3 times negative 1 plus 4. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1 plus 3 plus 4. Negative 1 plus 3 is 2. 2 plus 4 equals 6. Now I have to try f of 1. Well, that's going to be 1 cubed minus 3 times 1 plus 4. 1 cubed is 1. 1 minus 3 plus 4. 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 4 is 2. And lastly, I have to check 3 halves. f of 3 halves. Well, that's going to be 3 halves cubed minus... 3 times 3 halves plus 4. Well, now we got to be careful, right? Fractions, don't worry about it. 3 halves squared is simply 27 over 4. Minus 9 halves plus 4. Now, in order to do this, I'm going to put everything in. When I have fractions like this, you got to be able to do it without a calculator. So I'm going to make everything the same denominator. So I'm going to go times 2, times 4, times 4, times 2. So I have 27 fourths minus 18 fourths 
plus four fourths, or sorry, 16 fourths. Ooh, that was almost four. 27 minus 18 is 9. 9 plus 16 is 25. So I get 25 fourths. 25, right, divided by 4. Did I do that right? 27 minus 18 is 9. 9 plus 16 is 25. So I get 25 fourths. I know 24 fourths is 6. So 25 fourths would be 6 and a fourth. So my absolute maximum value, and it looks like my absolute minimum value, occur at endpoints. Right? So my absolute min is negative 14. My absolute max is 6 and 1 fourth. For some reason, I think I did something wrong on here. But that's, that's the answer. I'm running out of time here. We'll look more at this tomorrow. Absolute max of f is 6 and 1 fourth. Again, I got to report the f value. Absolute min of f is negative 14. That's it for today. I'll double check that work and make an addendum if something is wrong and let you know. Talk to you later. See you. Two James. Bye.